AP Biology, Chapter 46, Animal Reproduction, Part 1. The two types of reproduction are sexual and asexual reproduction. The prefix a means without, so asexual means without sex. That means we'd have no two sources of genetic information in order to produce our, um, our next generation. Production of offspring with genes from one individual so we're talking about all the genes coming from one individual and um, very little variation other than mutations. Some simple animals are able to do asexual reproduction, things like hydra, located here, about the size of your fingernail that lives in the ocean, a type of cnidarian relative to jellyfish. And then we have an echinoderm down here, the uh, starfish. When you break off their arm, they grow a whole new body, and that is asexual. Sexual reproduction, formation of gametes and fertilization. Remember that when you make your gametes, there's a lot of diversity in the gametes that you can make. You have um, crossing over during prophase one. There's also independent assortment of chromosomes, also during meiosis one. And we also have two sources of genetic information. The uh, three of those things together results in a lot of diversity in the possible offspring being made. They're not gonna be anywhere near a clone of the parents, Although, since they're getting the genetic information from their parents, they're going to look similar to them. Remember why sexual reproduction has an advantage. Sexual reproduction results in more diversity, and in a changing environment, which most environments do change, then you have more chances that an individual will have a survival or reproductive trait that can be selected for. If you reproduce asexually, less diversity in your populations, and that means less chance of a organism produced that has the ability to survive in a changing environment. The benefit of asexual reproduction is that you don't have to find mates. So if it is a uh, problem finding mates, let's say you're a parasitic worm in uh, intestines, then asexual re reproduction offers you a possibility of reproducing without finding another of your species. Parthenogenesis. Genesis means to create, partheno means virgin. Parthenogenesis means to create using a virgin. Now normally the queen will uh, be fertilized by a male and then that um, fertilized egg develops into a, a worker. However, what if the queen doesn't get fertilized by a male? Now if it was a human or any other animal, most other animals, they would just not be able to create any offspring. However, with uh, honeybees, the eggs that are haploid, one set of chromosomes, are able to develop into a fully functioning organism. That becomes a drone. And these drones, um, you know, do basic uh, hive maintenance um, in the colony for the bees. So, queen bees, able to uh, reproduce just like anything else. Haploid egg, fertilized by the haploid sperm, forming a diploid zygote, becomes a worker. However, when the queen lays eggs that are not fertilized, those haploid eggs can undergo mitosis and develop into a drone by itself. Now, if you're asking yourself how that's possible, well, consider you have two of every chromosome. So it's almost like you have a backup set. You got one set of 23 chromosomes from mom, one set of chromosome, 23 chromosomes from dad. However, um, you need both those sets in order for your cell to function properly. For some reason, these queen bees, when they make their eggs, the haploid cells don't require that extra set of chromosomes in order to do um, mitosis. However, all the genetic information is available in that one set of chromosomes. All right. Different uh, strategies for different organisms as far as reproduction. As a general rule, um, the reason why land animals uh, get so close when they mate is to directly place the sperm, which can dry out, inside the female. If we fertilized anything other than internally, externally, then it would be very difficult to keep that egg protected. Even insects will internally fertilize on land in order to uh, protect that egg. If you live in the water, drying out is not really an issue. So when those fish lay eggs in the water, the, um, the uh, sperm just swim to it through the water and fertilize it. That's external fertilization. Here we have hermaphrodites. Hermaphrodites, uh, actually you can break down this word. Hermes is the uh, god of um, speed. Aphrodite is the god of love. 
and you combine those two uh, words together, and you got a hermaphrodite, male and female. So hermaphrodites have both working male and female sex organs, and you find this uh, quite frequently in worms. Here we have a flatworm, a member of platyhelminthes, and these guys are very simple. This uh, worm has both the ovaries and testes, so they can self-fertilize within the, uh, the parasite they're infecting. Here we have earthworms mating. All earthworms have uh, both male and female reproductive organs, testes and uh, ovaries. So this worm here is transferring sperm to this worm, and this worm here is transferring sperm to this worm. So they're both getting pregnant at the same time. You have to wonder who's buying dinner. All right, what are hermaphrodites? Uh, just as a side note, uh, humans don't have true hermaphrodites. They're called intersex. Uh, typically, they have the uh, male and female reproductive organs, but they're non-functional, so they're not really true hermaphrodites. Typically, at a uh, very young age, they try to figure out whether the, um, the person with both sex organs likes boys or girls by giving them a, a series of tests and then shape the downstairs equipment accordingly based on their preference. All right, fertilization, we have external. That means that the sperm and egg uh, meet each other outside the body, and that's typically in aquatic animals for the obvious reason that um, uh, there's no survival advantage to internally fertilizing um, if you live in the water. You don't have to worry about things like drying out. We have internal fertilization, typically in terrestrial or land animals, and that's just to prevent the sperm from drying out. Now, there are some aquatic animals like dolphins and whales that fertilize internally. They just basically took their equipment for fertilizing internally back to the oceans with them. Remember, the science word for drying out is desiccation. All right, development. Here we have some external development versus internal development. For external development, we're talking mainly eggs. So in the water, uh, fish and other water critters will lay eggs, and uh, there's not much to those eggs. There's just basically the fertilized egg inside, maybe a small food supply, uh, but not much else. On land, um, there is a bit more uh, equipment inside the eggs to help it survive on land. We have uh, something called an amniotic egg uh, in both uh, reptiles and birds, and this amniote uh, is part of the egg structure. Basically what we're talking about here is a, um, a more complicated type of egg. We have a tough protection on the outside for both reptiles and birds. In reptiles it tends to be a little softer, but again that's to prevent from drying out. The reason why reptile and bird eggs are bigger is because they have a food supply inside called the yolk. The yolk uh, gets smaller as the developing embryo gets bigger and bigger. So we have an umbilical cord. We deliver the stuff via a uh, a, um, a transport system of our arteries that uh, allow the little baby to uh, get its nourishment. For a reptile, it's using the yolk as nourishment, and the yolk gets smaller as the, the embryo gets bigger. As you can imagine, there are some limits to the development of a reptile or a bird, because once you're out of yolk, you're not going to have any more food supply. If you're not born at this point and you're able to get your own food, you're not going to be able to get any bigger. When you have a placenta, which is a inner lining of the, um, the uterus that has a lot of blood vessels attached to the um, umbilical cord, you can keep on delivering nourishment to that developing young, and they can develop a lot longer. So mammals can develop much longer internally than things like um, reptiles and birds within an egg. Now we have some uh, words that you should be familiar with. By the way, the white stuff in an egg is basically just a shock absorber. And uh, the eggs you buy at the store don't uh, have the uh, embryo inside. Uh, you can find out if you hold up an egg to the light and you see a little red spot in there, that could be the embryo developing. That's typically seen in like farm eggs, but um, the hens in a modern uh, egg producing factory don't have any roosters around to fertilize them. So it's just gonna be yolk, a food supply for an embryo that doesn't exist. The word that we use for just laying eggs is called oviparous. The prefix ova refers to eggs. So you do need to know that, and we should write this down. Oviparous, lay eggs. Amnio uh, amniotic egg has a food supply inside. Protection allows development on land. And then we have the placental mammals that um, have internal development. Oviparous lays eggs. Ovoviparous 
the V part refers to life or being alive. Ovo refers to eggs. So ovoviparous refers to live birth from eggs. Don't get those two words confused. Oviparous just lays eggs like birds and reptiles. Ovoviparous, live birth from eggs. So sharks and some snakes will have eggs inside of them. The eggs hatch inside of them, and then the little sharks or snakes come out. And it kind of looks like a, a live birth from a placental mammal. However, there was no placenta or umbilical cord involved. It was just eggs inside instead of outside. And that's called ovoviparous. Now, as far as viviparous, that just means live birth. So if you've taken a Spanish class or know some uh, Latin or uh, other prefixes that mean life, viva means alive. So viviparous, live birth. All right, take a moment to uh, review some of the things that we just uh, discussed and what animals do it. So you should uh, think to yourself, what are the survival or uh, reproductive advantages with each type of um, sexual reproduction? And uh, you know, if you think about it, if you were like an insect that doesn't take care of your young and you had placental live birth that requires a long time to develop a kid, and um, you know you only develop one of them, then that doesn't make a whole lot of sense because you're not going to take care of your kid. So animals that tend to take care of their offspring and have a large, uh, fairly good chance of survival, the case strategists, tend to have longer developmental periods for their offspring. Animals that don't take very good care of their children um, tend to have more number of offspring and they take less care of them. They also tend to make the offspring with less materials. Things like insects uh, require very little material or uh, stuff from the uh, food they eat in order to make lots and lots of, uh, of insects. However, most of them won't survive. So it's a trade-off. Number of offspring versus survival of the offspring. And also the uh, survival of the parents as well. Parents can only take care of so many offspring. All right, human reproduction. So we're going to start with the male reproductive system and then uh, work on the female reproductive system. So let's go through some of these uh, parts here. We're going to start where the, uh, the uh, sperm is made in the testes. And then the, the next step after the testes for the sperm is to enter the epididymis. Now, if you're wondering why the um, testes are in a sac that hangs outside the body, you know, considering that it's a pretty big disadvantage in case you get kicked there, well, um, the sperm doesn't develop at a high temperature, and uh, people that end up being in hot tubs all the time tend to have a lower sperm count as a result of the difficulty of the sperm to um, be made at higher temperatures. So it's thought that the external uh, scrotum is a survival advantage in the sense that it allows sperm to develop at a lower temperature than it would inside the body. Now, something like a dolphin that doesn't have the outside testes lives in the water, cool water, so the development of sperm is not a, a big deal for dolphins and whales because their body is fairly cool as a result of that water rushing by it. The next step for the sperm is something called the epididymis. This is where the sperm mature. And then we have the next step, which is called the vas deferens. Now, the vas deferens is what's usually cut in a vasectomy, and there's two of them. You have two testes if you're a male. And once you cut that, you um, cannot transfer the sperm to uh, any of the other parts of the body. Now, a person that gets a, va a vasectomy still is able to produce the fluid. The fluid is produced by the um, prostate gland, the bulbo gland, and um, the seminal vesicle. So a male that has a vasectomy has the fluid, but no sperm in the fluid. Okay, so once the um, sperm travel up the vas deferens, it's going to loop around here above the bladder and then it uh, comes down again over here. And then right about here, we have a common duct for both the sperm and urine. So this is where the urine comes from in the bladder. Remember, urine came uh, ultimately from the kidneys. This is the ureter. This is the urethra. The urethra is the common tube for both sperm and urine. That's kind of gross, but it is what it is. We wouldn't be here if it wasn't for that fact. So now the sperm will travel through the urethra and uh, mixed in with the fluid from the uh, seminal vesicle, the prostate gland and bulbarethal gland comes out the penis. And that's how we do fertilization uh, or giving the 
uh, one set of chromosome of 23 from dad. Now, a couple of other things I want to point out. Uh, men tend to have a fairly long urethra, so it's more difficult for them to get bladder infections. See how long that urethra is? So the bacteria would have to come all the way up here in order to uh, get inside the, the bladder, and that's why um, it's more difficult to get a bladder infection as a male. One of the problems that men have after 40 is an enlarged prostate. And if you can take a look here, we have a prostate gland right there. And if this prostate gets enlarged, it's going to pinch off the urethra. And that makes it difficult for men with prostate problems to go to the restroom. Now, men after uh, 50 tend to get a prostate exam. And what they have to do is take a glove and go up the rectum, the other hole here, and then feel the prostate from the inside and uh, see if it's getting uh, larger or not. About half of men after uh, age 40 and 100% of men after age 70 have an enlarged prostate. It's sometimes said that it's better to have a female reproductive system after the age of uh, 40 and a male reproductive system before the age of 40 uh, because women don't have to worry about their monthly periods after their menopause, uh, which is really 45 to 55 uh, approximately. And um, before then, they have to worry about their periods. Uh, men don't have to worry about much downstairs uh, before they're 40, but after they're 40, their prostate starts to act up on them. All right, here's another view of the male reproductive system. We'll go through the same stuff again. Here we have the testes. This is where we make our, um, some of our sex hormones, like testosterone, and uh, we also make um, sperm. Remember, we make uh, sperm and egg by meiosis that we're going to talk about a little bit later. Here we have the epididymis. This is where the sperm mature, and then the sperm travel through the vas deferens. One of the things that they're able to do now with uh, vasectomies is add a little spigot inside the vas deferens. So you can come in with a small pliers and turn on the faucet, basically, to have kids if you wanted to. It's a more expensive procedure, but it does exist. Then the sperm travel around the back of the bladder and then meet up over here with the urethra. And this is also the common tube for the uh, urine as well. I think of the urethra, to not confuse that with the ureter located up here connected to the kidneys. The urethra throws away the urine. So and that's one way to help you remember it. It's the last tube before leaving the body or throwing something out of the body. Remember the prostate gland, bulbarethral gland, as well as the seminal vesicle all contribute fluid to the ejaculate. All right, so you should uh, know these things. Testes, that's where sperm is being made. Epididymis, that's where the sperm matures. Vest deferens con uh, connects the testes to the uh, urethra. The prostate and bulbarethral glands, that's fluid for uh, during sex. Bladder is a storage area for urine produced by the kidneys. Seminal vesicles, also um, used for fluid, and urethra is the final tube before the sperm or urine leaves the body. Make sure you write this down and understand the parts of the male reproductive system. Hormone control of the testes. Now, you remember we learned about um, the hypothalamus and the anterior pituitary in the last chapter, chapter 45. The anterior pituitary uh, releases something called FSH and LH. These are uh, known as follicle-stimulating hormones that will be um, referring to female parts and luteinizing hormone, also referring to some female things that go on. Uh, in order for FSH and LH to be released, however, there is uh, another hormone called gonadotropic releasing hormone released by the hypothalamus that triggers the uh, anterior pituitary to release these two hormones. Uh, if you're going to remember something, you don't have to remember the GnRH for any test I'm going to give. However, you should know that the anterior pituitary releases FSH and LH that are going to target the um, testes. Now, there's another thing you have to know. FSH targets some cells called Sertoli cells, and these Sertoli cells make sperm in a process called spermatogenesis. Genesis means to create, sperm means um, the male half haploid uh, cell that's involved with reproduction. So we're talking about making sperm. One way to help you remember that, there's an S in Sertoli, there's an S in sperm that might help you remember that. And that's triggered by FSH, which also has an S in it. The other uh, hormone released by the anterior pituitary involved with reproduction is LH, or luteinizing hormone. 
luteinizing hormone tr triggers the Leydig cells in the, um, the testes to make testosterone. And that one could be remembered too with L, Leydig, L, luteinizing hormone. Testosterone, well, that's the uh, sex hormone that uh, will be involved with uh, some things that we're going to talk about now. Testosterone will also encourage the uh, production of spermatogenesis or baking sperm. And testosterone is involved with the primary and secondary sex characteristics of males. So what are those primary and secondary sex characteristics? Anything that's directly involved with the, uh, the reproductive organs downstairs is a primary sex characteristic. So the development of the penis is a uh, primary sex characteristic. As far as secondary sex characteristics, we're talking about things that are associated with testosterone but are not directly involved with reproduction. Things like a um, deeper voice in males, uh, more hair in males, uh, more muscle development in males, those are all secondary sex characteristics triggered by testosterone. Primary sex characteristics, making sperm, development of the, the testes and uh, penis. When we make testosterone, uh, that is going to have a negative feedback effect to shut down the production of more FSH and LH, which will uh, in turn uh, result in uh, stopping the making of more sperm and testosterone. All right, so FSH and LH produced by the anterior pituitary, released as a response of GnRH released from the hypothalamus, are going to target the testes. The FSH will target the Sertoli cells that make sperm. The LH targets the Leydig cells that make testosterone. Testosterone encourages more spermatogenesis, as well as primary and secondary sex characteristics, primary characteristics like development of testes and penis, as well as um, secondary sex characteristics like more hair, deeper voice, muscles. Now the male reproductive system is fairly simple compared to the female reproductive system. So that will be coming up next. Make sure you understand the male stuff first. Spermatogenesis, meiosis, done in the um, Sertoli cells, are going to be making our gametes. So remember meiosis produces four cells. One, two, three, four. They're not genetically identical to the starting cell and they're only going to be haploid, one set of chromosomes our starting cell is diploid. Remember we have a meiosis 1 and meiosis 2 representing to two rounds of cell division required for meiosis. Don't get that confused with mitosis which is making body cells, somatic cells, and those are identical copies. Meiosis does not produce identical copies. Here we have a picture of what's actually going on. We have the seminiferous tubules um, and we have the sperm being created as a result of meiosis within the testes. Men make about uh, hundreds of millions of sperm a day, so there is a, a lot of spermatogenesis going on in males. That's also when you try to sell sperm versus eggs, sperm doesn't go for as a, uh, commands a high price, does not command a high price because you make so much of it. It's like a law of supply and demand. Women that sell their eggs can make a lot more money because they only have a limited number of eggs for their entire life. So it's still more than enough they need. It's over 100,000. In the Sertoli cells of the seminiferous tubules within the um, testes. That's something you should write down. Seminiferous tubules inside the testes where the sperm are actually being um, uh, collected and made. All right, the female reproductive system, we'll uh, start that with part two. This ends part one of your notes on chapter 46, animal reproduction.